Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. Come on, ladies. This is about us. Speak up. Don't be shy. That's more like it. All right. So the theme for this afternoon is Women First. And in the next hour or so, you're going to hear from these powerful ladies who come from the world of business, sports, government, politics, and more. And they're going to describe their experiences as groundbreakers. So my name's Amalia Duarte. I serve on the Mendham Township Committee. And I am a first generation, proud first generation Dominican American. Yeah. Come on. So I have a couple of firsts. My firsts are when I was elected to town council in 2017, I became the first person of Hispanic descent on the Mendham Township Committee, and also the first Democrat, but we're not gonna get political today. The nonpartisan event. But we're in the right spot for a celebration. Morristown, as you know, was an epicenter of the American Revolution, and these women are true revolutionaries. They've been fighting to make lasting change for now, and the next generation of young women. And Morristown, if you don't know, was the home to prominent women suffragettes going back over 100 years ago. <laughs> I mentioned two of them, Allison Turnbull Hopkins and Julia Hulbert. These were among the ladies back in 1917 who were arrested for picketing in front of the White House to get women the right to vote. So we have to thank them, right? Just want to quickly mention our sponsored. It's again a nonpartisan event sponsored by the League of Women Voters of the Morristown area. Our co-sponsors, the American Association for University Women, Madison Chapter, and Delta, Theta, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Morristown Alumni Chapter. So thank you so much to all our sponsors. And I just want to quickly thank the organizing committee, Donna Goriglia. Barbara Cuppersmith, Deborah McCumber, Nancy Hedinger, flip the page here, uh, Leslie Bensley, we'll hear from later, and our Morristown Council Vice President, Sandy Mayer. Thank you so much for getting us this space. And are there any elected officials here? I see uh, Morris Township Committee Woman Kathy Wilson, Carolyn Dempsey, I think I saw Council. Councilwoman Toshiba Foster, fantastic. I thought I saw Carolyn Densley, but I don't have my glasses on, so maybe not. Okay, anyone else? Any other electeds who are not speaking? Kelly Desset representing uh, Mikey Sherrill, our fabulous Congresswoman. Okay, terrific. All right, so we're gonna start off with a man. Nothing wrong with that, right? No, I'm, I'm teasing. Tim is a good friend, and he's our fantastic mayor of Morristown. And uh, he's going to say a few words. I think you have 30 seconds. And then we're going to start off with our amazing lineup of speakers this morning. So come on down, Tim Dougherty. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so honored and privileged to just say a few words, and, and I was told when I first walked up here I have 120 seconds. Uh, now I find out I have 30 seconds. Um, so I will keep it very brief, because I know you have a list of great women speakers on, on behalf of the, uh, the administration, the citizens of Morristown, uh, celebrating Women's History Month and celebrating women uh, as leaders of our country is no no greater honor than I could stand up here today and be the male speaker to open this up. So congratulations to the League of Women Voters, to our Vice President of the Council, Sandy Mayer and Maya, and all these women behind that are going to be speaking. Uh, I wish I could just sit back and listen to them all, but I am, and, and there's no press here, so don't write this down. Uh, I am on baby watch, uh, so my, uh, my daughter-in-law should be hopefully within two hours, so uh, I'm on, I'm on, I know, isn't that amazing? So, so if it wasn't for women, none of us would be here. Um, so there you go. So, so uh, on behalf of uh, Senator Anthony Bucco, I'd like to just uh, 
let everybody know that he sent over uh, all these certificates for every speaker, these um, accomplishments, um, and they will be handed out because if I read every one and read every women speaker here, I think I would not be asked back to opening remarks for a League of Women Voters Women History Month celebration. So on behalf of uh, myself and my family and my wife, who is uh, a true leader, um, thank you all for coming and thank you for allowing me to say a few words here today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mayor Tim, and thank you for keeping it brief. You're a fabulous speaker, and well, we've got so many great women to hear from. So let's get started. And before I do, I was just reminded, there are QR codes on the posters. So while our fabulous speakers are not going to be as brief as Tim, but also going to speak briefly, they have amazing accomplishments and accolades. And when they sent over their bios, it was you know several pages. So you go to the QR code, it will go to the web page, and you can learn more about them. And I'm sure they'll happy, happily speak to you afterwards, hopefully. All right, so let's get started. So this year is the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And if you know what that was, I was a beneficiary of that myself. Uh, it really blew open the doors for women to have opportunities to play sports from grade school through college and beyond. And if you're wa watching March Madness, you can thank Title IX that there's also a women's March Madness going on, right? My brackets are busted, so we won't talk about that. But go Peacocks, all right? <laughs> All right, so I'm excited to kick off our event with a sports groundbreaker, Donna Goriglia. She has been a driving force in USA Hockey, which is the national go governing body for amateur ice hockey. She was the first woman to serve on their board, and Donna has opened up the rink to a generation of girls and women across the country. So thank you, Donna. <laughs> Thank you, Amalia. Welcome, everybody. Congratulations to all the participants here today for all you have achieved as New Jersey Women First. In 1972, when Title IX was passed, I was in high school, and all the girls' teams in my high school were just intramural teams. While Title IX has grown participation in sports at the high school and college level, Overall, there are still fewer teams and lower budgets for women, and there aren't enough female coaches in the ranks. Ice hockey was definitely a male-dominated sport throughout my childhood. I relocated to Morris County once I was married, and Men in Arena was literally in my backyard. At the same time that my children were starting to play hockey at Menin, I ran for the New Jersey Colonials Board of Directors. The New Jersey Colonials Youth Hockey Association began in 1971 with 10 boys teams. It remains today one of the largest premier youth organizations in New Jersey with both boys and girls teams. I was elected to the board in 1999 and a year later I became the first female president. This was to become my first step onto the ice, so to speak, in the administrative roles I would take on. This led me to becoming the first female officer at USA Hockey in 78 years, when elected in 2015 as treasurer. Which Amalia mentioned, USA Hockey is the national governing body for all amateur ice hockey from age six to the national and Olympic men's, women's, and Paralympic teams. Our Paralympic men just won gold medal, the fourth one at the Beijing Woo! Paralympics. 1924 was the first Winter Olympics women participated in. Eleven women were there. At this year's Winter Olympics in Beijing, there were over 1,300. I have always been a long-time women's sports advocate and, it hel and helped advance the development of female ice hockey players for over 30 years. You can imagine when I became treasurer in 2015 and by 2017 found myself on the opposite side of the bargaining table with our own very own women's national team who was boycotting the 2017 Women's World Championships. They were being held on U.S. soil. The boycott was major news and USA Hockey was being called out on equal treatment and support for our women's national team compared to the men's teams. 
The players wanted the same investment and resources dedicated to marketing and women's hockey that men's hockey received. They wanted more developmental programs for girls across the country. I had worked for years as a volunteer improving and advancing girls' women's hockey and remember being torn between supporting them because I believed in what they were asking for but also knew that we could not support all the terms of the agreement. We finally found a resolution, signed an agreement, the players participated in that tournament and won a gold. I was also in Pyeongchang, South Korea for the 2018 Winter Olympics and this same group of players won the Olympic gold medal. This was a gold medal victory at the Olympics and a major victory for advancing women's equity in our sport. My experience, my experience in a white male dominated sports organization was met with many challenges. I sat in many meetings as the only female voice for years. I went through all the textbook scenarios women face when leaning into a space they have been kept out of for so long. The microaggressive comments about female athletes and why they did not belong in all sports. I was right in the middle of a good old boys network and had to continually navigate in order to stay relevant and have my voice heard. The problem isn't now and never was with girls or women. The problem was with the environment and the culture that needed to change. Women didn't need to adjust or be fixed. The environment needed to be more inclusive and supportive. With the help of many enlightened men and women I worked with, more opportunities became available. The challenges we have all seen in sport, including the high level of sexual assault and molestation cases, mental health issues, pay equity and training, anti-doping, transgender opportunities, and the lack of diversity in many sports, this all seems so daunting at times. But what participation in sports can do in a positive light is limitless. It is what children dream about. Female leaders in sport are breaking the barriers put in place by a male-dominated system that kept them at bay. Young girls are now watching females advance to positions of power in sport across the board and the boardroom. Female coaches, GMs, broadcasters, scouts, marketing reps, and administrative leaders are popping up in all sports. Student athletes outperform many other college grads in their careers and are highly represented among female business executives. With all that is happening in the world today, the courage, tenacity, and determination of women will prevail just like it has throughout history. Empathy and compassion are not our weakness, they are our power. Athletes are taught the name on the front of the jersey is who you play for and defend, not the name on the back. In the United States, we all have democracy on the front of our jersey. The lessons learned on a team and as a participant in sports have provided girls with the ability to persevere and compete in all aspects of their life, to achieve the goals they set, and as a champion, continue to champion for others. The most profound moment of almost any competition in the U.S. is hearing our national anthem being played or taking, taking to part in the most powerful chant heard around the world. So raise your flags and chant with me, USA, USA, USA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. All right, our next speaker is Cindy Flowers. She's with the Morristown Alumni Chapter of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Thank you so much, Cindy, come on up. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I feel very privileged to be a part of the League of Women Voters Women's First Event, celebrating Women's History Month and honoring women breaking boundaries today. As I was looking out and we were talking um, about the different speakers, I thought about, and I'm dating myself here, I thought about the song, Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves from the 80s, where it says we're standing on our own two feet and we're ringing our own bells. So that's how I feel today, that this is a day of empowerment for the women, that we ring our own bells. I am a member of the Morristown Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and our president, Kimberly Monroe, has been leading us. 
We are an organization of college-educated women committed to public service with the primary focus on the black community. We service the Morris, Sussex, Warren, and Hunterdon counties, and we've been serving proudly for 35 years. We have five point programmatic thrusts, economic development, educational development, physical and mental health, international awareness and involvement, and a political awareness and involvement. Today's event is part of our political awareness and involvement thrust. Tracy Yet is over there. Wait, Tracy. We are um, members of the Arts and Letters Committee of our chapter, and we're the co-curators of the Red Print Exhibit. Delta Sigma Theta is a sorority, an international sorority focused on public service and was founded in 1913, and we have a rich history of women's first, beginning with our first act of political activism by participating in the Women's Suffrage March in 1913. We've also progressed to becoming the first black Greek letter organization to be named a non-governmental organization by the United Nations in 2003. Through narratives, through written narratives and photography, Morristown alumni has told the trailblazing accomplishments of national and local African American women. Red Print, a tribute to education, was unveiled in 2019 and honored trend-setting black women in education. Red Print Heartbeat was introduced at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 and commended the pioneering efforts of African-American nurses and doctors. Red Print Unbought and Unbossed was a nod to black women in politics. And this year, we celebrate African-American women entrepreneurs with Red Print Minding My Own Black Business, placing a trademark on the world. When Tracy and I were working on the exhibitions, we were very conscious to attack, attach physical attributes to the themes. Red print refers to the physical fingerprint. A fingerprint, by definition, is a deliberate impression left by friction ridges of a human finger. The women in our exhi exhibit trailblazed through friction and adversity and left a permanent mark on the world. As I mentioned, Delta Sigma Theta has been on the forefront. Mary McLeod Bethune, a member of Delta Sigma Theta, founded the Detona Educational and Industrial Training School for Negro Girls in 1904, which later became Bethune Cookman University in Detona, in Daytona, Florida. And she was also a member of Franklin D. Roosevelt's cabinet. Here in Morristown, Dr. Anita Barber was the youngest only female and only minority principal in the Morristown District, and Dr. Janet Jones, who took on the task of increasing minority representation on teaching staff, are women who have left an imprint on society, and they are members of the Morristown Alumni Chapter. Red Print Heartbeat. A heartbeat is a pulsation of heart. Women who are first in their fields have a pounding passion and drive that no one can distinguish, diminish, or extinguish. Jocelyn Elders was the first African-American appointed Surgeon General of the United States. She dealt with racism when many assumed that she was not qualified to be in the post. And she's a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Morristonian Gladys Lewis was the first black registered nurse at Morristown Memorial Hospital when job opportunities were mostly domestic service. Both women determined not to let the world decide their qualifications. Red Print African American Women in Politics is about women leaving their impressions on the world through politics. An impression leaving a mark by pressing. Shirley Trism, a member of Delta Sigma Theta, who left quite a mark on the world by becoming the first African American woman in Congress in 1968. And the first woman, an African American, to seek the nomination for President of the United States in 1972. <laughs> Shirley pressed her ideas of race and gender equality by introducing more than 50 pieces of legislation. Sheila Oliver took the oath of office as New Jersey's Lieutenant Governor, making her the first woman of color to serve in a statewide elected office in New Jersey history. And Carolyn Blackman, who became the first female and first mayor of Dover. 
Oliver and black men both leaving their marks on New Jersey. Red print leaving a trademark on the world. A trademark is a distinctive stamp or mark in the st stamping process for metal. A tool is used to form the metal into new shape. Women have been shaping the business world for centuries. Maggie Lena Walker was one of those women. In 1903, she founded St. Luke Penny Savings Bank and became the first woman of any race to charter a bank in the United States. Leading the business world is Kathy Hughes, who established Radio One in 1980, which is comprised of 70 radio stations and aligned with Comcast to create cable network TV One. She was the first African-American woman to head a publicly traded firm. These women leaving their mark. Telling the courageous stories of women ties us to history. And Morristown alumni chapter is leaving our own mark on Morristown history. Our collaboration with the Morristown Library has given us the opportunity to have our ex exhibitions to be a part of the historical record of Morristown. Sharing the narratives of these women helps us to bring generations together so the commitment and sacrifices will never be forgotten and can speak to future trailblazers who will learn that women leading corporations are being the top in their fields and governing the laws of the state and nation are possible and can be accomplished by anyone. Thank you so much. Fantastic, thank you so much, Cindy. Okay, so next up, we heard a little bit earlier about uh, ice hockey, and we all know that's a bruising sport, but if you think ice hockey is bruising, imagine local government. <laughs> we know. <laughs> all right, so our next speaker is a pioneer in that arena, Jillian Barrick, who is the business administrator for Morristown. Quite an introduction. <laughs> all right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Morristown. I'm happy to have you all here. Um, in preparing for today's remarks, I was really kind of thinking, what, I, what is it that I want to say? And I'll tell you, I'm not typically in the position to speak about myself, uh, but I was asked to tell a little bit about my story. So um, I'm going to share a, a little bit of, of how I ended up in Morristown and some of the things that I've learned along the way. Um, so growing up, um, I wanted to be an architect, and I wanted to be an architect that went to Georgia Tech. Go Jackets! Go Jackets! Um, and I blazed that trail through middle school, through high school, into crafty classes, and I got into Georgia Tech early, and I'm so excited to be on campus, and probably about a year in, I discovered I hated architecture. <laughs> I enjoyed the field, but it just was not a passion of mine. Um, and so I studied and kind of tried to figure out a way to, to make it work, and it, and, and it slowly became clear that that just wasn't a good fit for me. Um, so I explored, um, and I, I did a bunch of different things, and I discovered city planning. Um, and I took some, some classes, I decided to do a minor in city planning, um, and ultimately one day called my parents and said, I don't want to be an architect anymore. And they were very surprised because I've been talking about it for so long and my father's like, you can't do that, you know, like that's what you committed to. And I was like, that, I don't, my heart's not in it. Um, and so I bravely decided to change my path, um, which uh, was very telling for me because city planning has become a foundation of my career um, and, and a foundation of, of the things that I do professionally, certainly um, here in Morristown. Um, so the lesson I learned at that point was do not be afraid to pivot. Um, I know Mar uh, Michelle Obama talked about that in her book, um, and I think it's really important to sort of reflect on the things that really make sense for you. And if you need to make a change, don't be afraid to, to make that change. Uh, and don't limit yourself simply because you think you've made that commitment. Um, because there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of life in front of you. Um, and you never know what may unfold before you if you take that opportunity. So now that I've discovered city planning, I decided that I wanted to be an intern. So the year before I graduated from college, um, I was able to intern at the City of East Orange uh, through the mayor, a connection my father had through the mayor's office. Government, that's what you do, right? Um, so I was eager and I showed up my first day at the city planning department in East Orange and the planning director refused to meet with me. 
Um, in fact, she avoided meeting with me for over a week. Um, and then eventually she sat down with me. She said, you know what? I really don't want you here. Um, but I have to deal with you, so you know, here's some tasks that she gave me some menial things to do. Um, and then ultimately, you know, I had some other people in the department take me under their wing because they kind of felt bad for me. Um, but I made I, I made the decision after kind of going home and crying a little bit because, um, like, how dare she, right? Um, but then I ultimately decided, you know what? This is an opportunity. I'm going to make the most out of it. And so I took the, the opportunity to, to get to know the other managers in my department. I got to know other people in town hall um, and, and ultimately learned a lot that summer. I learned more than I ever could have imagined. And at, by the end of the summer, I won her over, surprisingly, um, and, I was, and I was able to earn a full-time position uh, when I graduated from college. And so I ended up returning to East Orange as a full-time employee under Mayor Bowser, and I couldn't be more grateful. Um, but had I responded to, to her criticism of me and her lack of wanting me there um, and kind of withering away, I never would have had that opportunity. And, and I'll tell you, Mayor Bowser to this day is one of my biggest mentors. And the people that I met in, in City Hall and East Orange still remain a part of my extended family. And I would never have had that had I walked away. Um, so the lesson I learned certainly, and I think a lot of you can appreciate this, is don't let your haters discourage you. Um, oh. And that is especially true for young women, um, particularly young women that are coming up in a profession that you don't see a lot of young women, especially a lot of young women of color. You know, we have a responsibility to really bring those women up, you know, regardless of how they ended up in your lap. Um, you know, you really have a responsibility to train them up and, and thank God uh, that I had others around me who were able to, um, to help me through that process. Um, it also gave me a little bit of a thick skin, which really, um, uh, served me very well in this business, I gotta tell you. Um, <laughs> so, fast forward some years later, uh, I, I left government and I was working for a public finance firm doing public sector consulting. Um, and it was great, it gave me a lot of experience in other cities and other states, um, but I was kind of getting tired of consulting and I wanted to do something different. Um, and so I had an old boss who had been appointed to the Commerce Department as for uh, President Obama. And he called me, he said, you know, you really should come and work with me. I can get you an appointment with the president. So I went and I said, okay, let me see. Um, and it was really impressive. I gotta tell you, federal government's really cool. Uh, but I will tell you, as I, as I went through the interview process, it just, it didn't speak to me. Um, but it was a presidential appointment under Obama. I mean, the greatest president, in my opinion, that we've, we've had thus far. Um, Absolutely, absolutely, and I and I while I wanted the opportunity to work with him, it just it just didn't it didn't pull at me. Um, but you know, I said, you know what? I've always lived my life to kind of take advantage of opportunities, and so I accepted the appointment. I was going through the vetting process, um, and it was funny because I had a lot of obstacles along the way, so it took a long time. Um, and then while I was traveling for my job at the time, I was in Jackson, Mississippi, of all places, and I ran into Mayor Bowser from East Orange who was sitting in the airport in Jackson, Mississippi. And I said, well, what are you doing here? He said, what are you doing here? Um, and he said, well, you know what? My administrator just resigned, and I want you to come back and be my administrator you start. And I'm like, ha, 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 you're really funny. That's, that's funny. He said, no, seriously. Like, you know, you really should consider it. And mind you, I already accepted the appointment in, in uh, D.C. But I went home, and I really thought about it, and I slept on it, and I prayed on it, and that spoke to me. As, as cool and as interesting and as important as the federal government is, personally, I think the greatest level of government and the most important level of government is local government. It is. If you think about it, we touch your lives every day. It's the cop, the firemen that just drove by. <laughs> it's the cops. It's it's the, the public works. It's paving the roads and put, putting potholes, paving potholes. All those things that touch everyone's lives every day. That to me is really important. It's important to have people in those positions who are as passionate about local government and serving our local community as I am. And so after a lot of prayer, I decided to turn down the presidential appointment and accept the appointment in East Orange. And I gotta tell you, my, my old boss wasn't happy with me. Um, a lot of people thought I was totally crazy, but it was the right choice for me. Um, and it turned out to be great. I got to come home to, to New Jersey. My mom's here. My family's here. Um, I got to meet really great people and I, I got to forge a career in local government that I'm passionate about. 
just like the cops. Um, so, you know, the lesson I learned was to follow your passion. other things others think you're crazy um, and that's especially true for women because everyone has an opinion and I know a lot of us are socialized to please others um, before you please yourself and had I done that I would have missed out on an opportunity to build this career that I'm, I'm so passionate and grateful for um, and, and the reality is that the only person that can live your life is you so you've got to put yourself first all right uh, rounding it out um, so coming to Morristown, which is now my third town, um, when I came and met with, with uh, Mayor Darty, who's now going to hopefully meet his baby soon, um, he and I struck, you know, struck a great rapport. But what really struck me was when I came and interviewed with the uh, governing body, which at the time had four dynamic women in leadership positions, including Mayor, uh, Mayor, Mayor Councilwoman Shiva Foster, who was here at the time. Um, and there were some wonderful, diverse women who were accomplished leading this community. And it struck me that, that not only is Marstown diverse in population, but it's diverse in leadership, and they appreciate those of us who bring different things to the table, and they appreciate women in positions of leadership. And so if you find yourself in an environment where you're not the only one, treasure it. Lean on the people around you. Build on that experience because you don't find that everywhere. I know particularly myself, I think in every town I've been in, I've either been the first woman or the first black woman or the first uh, minority in a position of leadership. And that's not the case here in Morristown. And I relish it and I'm grateful for these women and those of you who are in the audience that I work with every day, I'm grateful for you. And I appreciate the fact that this community values you as much as I do. And so lastly, throughout my life, I've had a lot of mentors and influential people who have invested in me. And there's too many to mention. Um, but I now know that it's my responsibility as well to be an example and a beacon for others, especially on women who may want to come up behind me. I also think it's my responsibility to draw, on other, to draw the others into the fold so that one day a black female administrator like myself isn't such a novelty. So I challenge you as I challenge myself to be an example and be a light for others. Thank you. Well, for someone who's not used to speaking about yourself, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and, and you know, part of this really is, and the whole the, one of the purposes of Women's History Month is to hear from different voices, right? So we do have a lot of women who are gonna speak today and hang in there. The sun is starting to come out. It's starting to warm up a little bit. All right, so shifting from government, we're gonna to pivot to the corporate world. It's my honor to introduce Donna Pepe. She is a trustee at the County College of Morris, a successful entrepreneur, a former senior executive at Johnson & Johnson, where there she built the company's first in-house marketing communications department and became the firm's first woman vice president. So Donna Pepe. Hi everybody. Thanks to the Women's League Women Voters who uh, inviting me here today. Uh, there's a lot of older people here, but for the younger ones, I think I'd like to set the table a little bit for what it was like uh, when I started out in the world <laughs> and uh, the working world. Uh, I graduated high school in 1970. And in 1970, uh, there, were, there were really three paths for women, teachers, nurses, or secretaries. And I did not want to be any of those. And so that was a problem uh, because we had a very um, traditional guidance counselor, a man who you know, thought that I should go to a college because they were allowing you to wear pantsuits. You know, we weren't allowed you to wear pants in school. So, uh, so this was the direction 
It wasn't like, oh, you're a National Merit Scholar? Yes, you should be applying to Columbia. No, you should go into this place where pantsuits are allowed. <laughs> anyway, I, I did go there, and uh, I did wear a pantsuit, and uh, I t it turned out that uh, we had a reciprocal uh, arrangement with an all-men's college at the time. This is in the city, in the Bronx, uh, Manhattan College. And so I ended up taking almost all my courses at Manhattan. So I was like one of like seven women uh, at Manhattan College taking courses. And the men there and the, uh, the Christian Brothers, it was run by Christian Brothers, still is today, uh, didn't know really what to do with me. Uh, but I persevered and that became, this sort of became the theme of my whole career. So I, I, I graduated with a degree in modern foreign languages. I, I studied French, Spanish, Italian, and German. And when I graduated, it was my intention to work for the United Nations and travel the world. Well, I went to the United Nations, and one of the men who interviewed me told me, well, there's really no jobs for Americans here at the United Nations. You have to be native born, and then we'll hire you. So then I was like, okay, crap, what am I gonna do now? It's four years of college, I have loans, and I need a job, and I have no clue what I'm going to do. Well, uh, as luck would have it, I, I had worked, um, my way through school and I worked with three cardiologists and <laughs> this uh, particular group of cardiologists uh, used to do executive physicals for uh, the, the executives of Franklin National Bank in Westbury and and lo and behold this one man used to come in every week with his wife and she used to get B12 shots I'll remember this till the day I die uh, and he used to talk to me about my career, what do, what do I want to do, and what am I going to do when I graduate college, and well, lo and behold, he turned out to be the senior vice president of personnel for the bank. So when he knew I was graduating, he said to me, uh, well, you know, we have, a, we have an executive training program uh, at the bank, uh, would you like to become part of that? And I said to him, well, I don't think that would be a good idea for the bank, and he was like, well, why not? And I said, because when I, can't balance my checkbook, I close it and I open it in another bank. <laughs> and so he was like, oh, well, what, do you, what else do you think you might want to do? Anyway, I ended up uh, getting a job that he created, they created for me in public relations uh, at the time, and I started to sort of cut my teeth there. It was all men. Uh, I was the only woman that was actually uh, in a position that wasn't secretarial. And, um, and that lasted for a while, but the bank uh, went under. <laughs> it defaulted, and then I needed to find another job. So and then I ended up somehow in hospitals, and that was kind of a crazy thing because it was rampant sexual harassment going on in the hospitals. And uh, my, my first hospital job was with a woman who was getting divorced, and she was sleeping with everybody in the, in the hospital. And we had, we were, our office was in an apartment, so you can imagine how awful that was. So I thought, it's time for me to move on from here. Well, I went to a bigger hospital in Brooklyn, actually, the Methodist Hospital, and it turned out that the executive director of the hospital was sleeping with his secretary, and that, that sort of went through the whole thing. Anyway, long story short, I was like, okay, enough with the hospitals. I gotta try something else. And so I went, I, I w was recruited to, to uh, work for uh, a public relations agency called Person Marsteller. And they were starting a pharmaceutical uh, division. And at that time, this was uh, 1980, around 1979, 1980, uh, pharmaceutical companies really didn't use public relations. And so there were a few that were starting to think about using it. And so we, I was one, I was actually the first account executive hired for this group. And, um, and I worked on a bunch of uh, really interesting drugs. Pfizer was a big, uh, uh, big, a big client of theirs, so I got to work on Viagra. Oh my God! Anyway, it'll all be in my book. Anyway, so, so fast forward, fast forward. I uh, I worked on the Tylenol recall, the first one, and um, and I I was still young then, and I didn't know that you were supposed to like you know, suck up to the chairman or whatever. So I would go to these meetings and I'd be like the most junior person, right? Be the uh, person, Harold Burson who owned the agency, a couple of people and then me who was supposed to be like, I don't know, serving drinks or whatever. And so the chairman was talking and he asked something and I was like, I, 
opened my mouth and I said to him that I don't think I don't agree with any of that. He was like, "What?" <laughs> and so uh, they uh, he ended up like talking to me afterwards, and I guess he was very impressed because uh, about six months later he sent a recruiter to recruit me to go to work for Burson Marcello, uh, from Burson Marcello to um, Johnson and Johnson. So at the time, that was 1983. Johnson Johnson had 144 uh, separate companies, and out of uh, all of them, the pharmaceutical sector was the one that made the most money. And there were only three companies there: there was Johnson, Johnson's uh, Janssen, Ortho Pharmaceutical, and McNeil Pharmaceutical. And Ortho Pharmaceutical was not identified as a Johnson and Johnson company because they made contraceptives. So they didn't want to pick on anybody to know that they were making contraceptives. So they asked me to go work for the contraceptive division. And they I don't think they had any clue uh, what my job was supposed to be. So it was kind of nice because I could do really whatever I wanted. And they just had no idea if it was right or wrong. So the bar was really low. So anything you did above that was going to be great. And, um, and so uh, when I went in there, uh, oral contraceptives were really having a hard time. It was like 13% market share, which is really terribly low. And there were all these, um, all these things lingering, misconceptions about pills, because in the old days, the, when the pills first came out, there were very high doses of estrogen and progesterone, and they caused a, caused a lot of problems. But over the years, the dosage had been uh, reduced significantly and didn't really have those problems anymore, but nobody really knew about that. So that was my job, and believe it or not, all the product managers that were responsible for marketing uh, oral contraceptives, they were all what, men. And so they had no freaking clue what they were to do. And so I would go to these meetings and I would just be sitting there saying, what the hell is going on here? Anyway, I just decided this is crazy. We have to do something really unique. So I started, um, I started doing things that were really out of the box, especially for this company. Um, I recruited uh, Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan and Bella Abzug and all kinds of high-level uh, leaders in the women's uh, movement. And they became spokespersons for oral contraception. And even Dr. Re Ruth Westheimer, who was just starting out in her radio program, and she used to talk about using diaphragms and condoms. and I went to see her and I said, nobody uses diaphragms, only college educated women in Boston, Chicago and New York use diaphragms. Why are you could talk about that? So she was like, oh, I didn't know that. So, so she came in and we, we got them, I got all the medical directors, they showed her all the stuff and then after that, all she talked about it was oral contraceptives. So um, that was like my whole uh, career there. I was there 10 years and um, and you know my boss, who was the president of the company, um, you know promoted me uh, over and over again. And then I became vice president, the first vice president on the ortho board. But then they thought, well, what, no other boards in, the, in these companies in the pharma sector have women, so we'll just put her on all the other boards too. It was like a buy one get three free. <laughs> and uh, believe me, it didn't come with any money. So. Um, so I did that for a while, and I built a, I built the uh, the function uh, worldwide, and so I had a worldwide responsibility. And it became clear that they weren't going to make me a president of a company, even though I was selling out every drug on the shelf. And so I decided to, uh, when I was pregnant with my second in 1990 that it was time to think about something else. And so a bunch of my friends that I had been on the boards with and moved off and become like presidents of other pharma companies. And they kept calling me up and saying, why are you there? You need to be here. And so I decided to form my own company. And it was called Communication Strategies. And I, um, I it was uh, all referral. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, it, was, it, it was a company that I worked just on pharmaceuticals for all referrals. And uh, I worked on a lot of drugs that you would recognize, household names, Claritin, um, Plan B, or contraceptives took it over the counter, and uh, a bunch of other products that you will know in your cabinet. But um, it was a great, it was a great run. I'm, I'm here to tell about it. it. It's funny in retrospect, but it was hard coming up. And um, 
you know, I, 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 I hope that uh, women now do not have to have as much, uh, <laughs> suffer as much harassment and, and discrimination as, as I did and many of my colleagues, but um, no one has to feel sorry for me because I'm doing okay. So. <laughs> Wow, I didn't know I had a comedian in the lineup. That was great. <laughs> All right, so moving right along. <laughs> I saw the young ladies really were listening to that. Uh... Okay, so we're going back into politics. As we know, the political arena has been dominated by men until very recently. We only just celebrated the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote in 2020. <laughs> All right, more women are running for office, more women are winning, but we have a long way to go. Uh, we're definitely making great strides. I believe in, in Congress this year, we have more women, correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly, than in any other previous year. Yes, yes, excellent, including Mikey Sherrill. All right, so I'm honored to introduce our Chatham Borough Council President, Irene Trelawar. She serves alongside three women who are trailblazing co-council member. Together, these women make up a majority of the Chatham Borough Council. As daughter of uh, Korean immigrants, Irene is the borough's first Asian American elected official as well. So let's welcome Irene. Thank you, Molly. I didn't know if I was gonna be going next, but that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> So I'm Irene Chalor, Chatham Borough uh, Council President. Um, as Amalia said, I'm first generation Korean American. And the Korean culture that I was exposed to growing up was very traditional and patriarchal. Men were expected to be the breadwinners, and women were expected to be the homemakers and caregivers. Women were also expected to defer to their husband's judgment in most things. However, for my immigrant parents, and like many immigrant parents, the reality of starting a new life in a new country is that both parents need to work outside the home and both need to pitch in with household duties and taking care of the kids. So my female role model growing up, my mother, struggled with having to earn an income to support the family while still being expected to fill her traditional role. She also struggled with raising strong, educated, independent daughters while still wanting them to find good husbands who will take care of them. And these remain internal struggles with which she still battles to this day. I, on the other hand, as a girl growing up in the 90s America, did not feel the same weight of having to fit inside a box or fulfill any womenly roles. Women were pursuing careers in all industries, delaying marriage and children, or deciding not to get married or have children at all. Their identities were no longer defined solely by the home. I understood that sexism existed, even saw it in my parents' personal dynamics, but it was not part of my own identity. And so I went to college, earned a degree in chemistry, went to law school, and began working full-time as a lawyer. Fast forward 15 years, and in 2019, when I and those who shared my values were looking for candidates to run for local council, I stepped up and ran myself. It sounds straightforward when I put it that way, but it wasn't. As much as I thought I had broken free of gender expectations, I still struggled with expectations I put on myself, expectations that were reinforced by society. Was I gonna get married? When? Was I gonna have kids? Is it okay to come home so late after the kids have been put to bed? How can I be a professional, a wife, a mother, and devote a sizable chunk of my already packed schedule to being a government official without something giving way. Certain things got me through those. For instance, having great role models. My mother demonstrating financial independence, the women that I worked with balancing family and career. Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg demonstrating how far women can go in the legal profession. These all helped me remember that I can be independent and have a career while still having a strong marriage and family if I chose. Also, seeing women stand up and put themselves out there to run for elected office, especially after 2016, was contagious. In 2018, we saw a huge wave of women stepping up and running for office for the first time in their lives. Not because they had some plan their whole lives, 
but because they felt it was important and could not sit on the sidelines any longer. So I thought to myself, if they are going to stick out their necks and do what they think is right and important, then I need to pitch in and help too. But the hardest part was yet to come. Time and energy and commitment of being an attorney. But in yet another break from expected, expected gender roles, it took my husband to get me to see the value of what I am doing. He pointed out things that I just hadn't noticed. How not just our daughter, but our, also our son, does not think that there's anything a woman cannot do. How they don't think that there are any mommy jobs or daddy jobs. When a boy told our daughter long before 2016 that a woman couldn't be president, she wasn't chagrined or angry. Instead, she was puzzled. It was like someone told her that the sky was green. In contrast to me, my husband grew up in a very non-traditional household with both a strong female role model and a strong male role model, and they supported each other and worked as a team. Both of my husband's parents were intimately involved in his upbringing while still having lives outside the house. Growing up in such an environment fundamentally changed my husband's views of not just marriage, being a true partnership, but also of people just being people, with gender not even entering into the equation of how someone is valued or perceived. But we still have a long way to go as society. This was starkly demonstrated during the pandemic when we saw a disproportionate number of women leaving the workforce because they still shouldered the majority of the burden of household duties and childcare. Would this have happened if women and men earned equal pay for equal work? In our household, where my husband and I are both lawyers, and so not as affected by this discrepancy. It was my husband who stayed out of the workforce to ensure that our kids paid attention to virtual school and did their homework, ensured we had dinner together every night, and ensured that I could work peacefully from home even though we had two children cooped up in the house. Would this have happened if he didn't have both a strong female role model growing up and a male role model showing him that man is defined by more than his job? In order to reach true gender parity, we have to change the way that we think of not just women's role in society, but also men's. In fact, we need to stop thinking about gender at all in terms of societal expectations. This change will not happen on its own. It will continue to require women to be role models for both boys and girls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. Okay, moving along, I'm sure you've all heard of Venus and Serena Williams, <laughs> world-renowned tennis players, okay, superstars. Well, they have in some measure to thank our next speaker, former tennis professional Leslie Allen, who was among the first top black uh, tennis pros, and back in 1981, she became the first black woman to win a significant professional tennis tournament since Althea Gibson in 1958. There was a 23-year gap. So let's give that big round of applause to our tennis groundbreaker, Leslie Allen. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm not trying to be cool here with sunglasses on, but if I take my glasses off, I can't see. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I want to uh, thank you so much for having me here today. And welcome to my neighborhood because I live right down the street, I work right down the street at West End, and I look out here and I see some of my yoga ladies, some of my real estate clients <laughs> and colleagues, so I'm just glad to be here. What I'm going to talk to you today is about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Alright, so let's just start with celebrating women who've broken barriers is a joyous occasion, but for me, it's a trigger. Breaking barriers, just those words, sound painful. And it reminds me that those who came before me had dreams deferred because they faced institutional racism, sexism, financial inequities, and had no opportunity to break barriers. So when I became the first black woman to win since Althea Gibson, it was a global viral moment. 
And y'all, that was before the internet. That was before, <laughs> before TikTok and everything else. As a teen, I had an improbable dream to play pro tennis, thanks in part to Billie Jean King and Title IX. But I quickly realized that I had to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Still today, discomfort is a daily thing. It's a given for people of color. It just is, y'all. And when women step outside the norms of women's roles, that is uncomfortable too. But my dream caused an extra level of discomfort. Because you see, I was told, Leslie, you are too tall to play tennis. <laughs> Leslie, black people don't have the intellect to play tennis. Leslie, you started too late. You don't have a shot. And also, my favorite, getting all sweaty and running around those short tail <laughs> skirts is not ladylike. But I knew in order to change the tennis world and carve a path for players like Venus, Serena, Sloan, Coco, I had to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Now, today, we try to legislate comfort because we create laws that say what you can say, what you read, and what you can teach kids so they are not uncomfortable. Now, I know you've all probably seen some viral moments of people in a store or a restaurant that absolutely lose their mind because somebody made them feel a little bit uncomfortable. What I can tell you, those people will not be breaking any barriers. <laughs> because breaking barriers is not easy. And this is especially for the young folks in the microwave world. It's not done quickly, and it's not done without consequences. And even once you are established or have accomplished your goal, there are still going to be uncomfortable moments. Like when I was the tournament director and a tennis executive, and I told a client what the ticket policy was, and she looked at me and said, well, I want to speak to the real tournament director. So I turned her over to my 26-year-old white male intern, and she was happy. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> I face, so what I want to say to you, to all of you all, but especially to the young people, don't let the thought of being uncomfortable deter you. I face microaggressions head on. Learn to be determined, resilient, and win against the best in the world on and off the playing field. I use those real life skills learned from being uncomfortable with my win for life athletes and my real estate clients today. I sometimes say, come on y'all, I got to center court Wimbledon. I can help you buy or sell your house or I can help you be a better student athlete. You have to be willing to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and then you can change your world. Now, that was going to be my end, but I'm going to add one more thing, especially since I see the young ladies. I want you to be clear about what I mean when I say uncomfortable. And I can tell you from my heart and from my own experience, it's not the uncomfortable you feel when someone tr is trying to sexualize you. That's not what I'm talking about. And it's also not the uncomfortable you feel when your partner is emotionally or physically abusing you. If that is happening to you, I urge you to tell someone and tell someone else and tell someone else until you are heard. I am talking about The uncomfortable that I am talking about is someone who is trying to take away your shine 
put up obstacles or undermine you. You want to break barriers? Get comfortable with being uncomfortable and change your world. That was a fabulous message. Thank you so much. Um, just in terms of our program, we're going to have another speaker. We're going to. Have